We're going to do a little bit of drawing today as we learn about the molecular structure. Structure is important when it comes to developing new drugs and or new product. For example, understanding how atoms bond within molecules provides insight into cell replication. Building on this knowledge, the shapes of molecules reveal the effectiveness of important antibiotics such as penicillin. And scientists can manipulate shapes of these molecules to help design new cancer treating drugs. So we're going to talk about the structure of ionic compounds and the structure of covalent molecules. The structure of an ionic compound, any ionic compound, is called a lattice structure. This is where positive cations are attracted to negative anions to form a network or a lattice of oppositely charged ions arranged in a 3D pattern. So you can imagine it goes negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, positive in a 3D structure where the negative represents the anions and the positive represents the cations. This lattice structure is for all ionic compounds. Now for covalent molecules, it's a little different. Now, there is no one structure for all covalent molecules. You guys just explored all the different shapes of covalent molecules. The shapes come from a theory called valence shell electron pair repulsion theory, otherwise known as VSEPR. This theory states that electrons arrange themselves in a molecule so as to be as far apart as possible. Because think about it, electrons are negatively charged. What will two electrons do when they try to get close to each other? They will repel each other. So an electron will have as much space as it can get. Now a lone pair of electrons repels or takes up more room than a shared electron pair. Now remember when I say pair, it means two electrons right? Two electrons in one pair. So when we talk about a shared pair of electrons, we're really talking about a bond. So how many electrons are in a bond? Two electrons are in a bond. Two different atoms are sharing each of electron, each of their own electrons in a bond. A lone pair of electrons means that it is not sharing electrons with any other atom. It is not in a bond. It is two electrons on the central atom. So the VSEPR theory allows us to predict the shape of molecules in 3D. So these are the different shapes that you guys just explored using the FET simulation. You have the shapes linear, bent, trigonal planar, trigonal pyramidal, and tetrahedral. Take a look at the general formula. The general formula for linear is AB or AB2, meaning that a linear-shaped molecule has two outside atoms. Now the first one you see here, you see that there is no central atom. So both of these atoms are considered to be outside atoms, whereas this one has two outside atoms and a central atom. Both of these linear shaped molecules have a bond angle of 180 degrees. So the bond angle that I'm talking about is from here to here. So that has a bond angle of 180 degrees. Now what's the difference between linear and bent? Because they both have the general formula AB2. They both have two outside atoms. Well, it really comes down to the lone pair. A bent shaped molecule has a pair has two pairs of lone pairs, whereas a linear shaped molecule does not. For a bent molecule, we have bond angles of 104.5 degrees. Let's take a look at both of our trigonal shapes. We have trigonal planar and trigonal pyramidal. Both have three outside atoms, hence the prefix tri in the name. So what's the difference between these two shapes? One has a lone pair and one does not. So the pyramid has a lone pair, so that lone pair pushes the other bonds down and it gives it a pyramid-shaped form. So trigonal planar has bond angles of 120 degrees, and then trigonal pyramidal has bond angles of 107 degrees. The last one is tetrahedral. 
So tetra means four. So you'll see that a tetrahedral will always have four outside atoms. A tetrahedral does not have lone pairs and it has bond angles of 109.5 degrees. Now we draw Lewis dot structures to help us visualize how the atoms bond by sharing electrons. And by drawing the Lewis dot structures, it will also help to predict the shape of the molecule. Now remember when we draw the Lewis dot structure, it's all about valence electrons. As a reminder, you have a picture of it on your screen here. So an example of a Lewis dot structure, now this one is actually very complicated, is down here. You see that a single bond has one dot pair where each electron is coming from the two different atoms. So one of these is from oxygen and another one of these are from hydrogen. There is a double bond where you have two dot pairs and then you have a triple bond where you have three dot pairs. Now we won't do, we won't draw Lewis dot structures that are this complicated just yet. We're going to start simple. In general, you want to always ask yourself, and this is how you check your work, are all atoms happy with eight valence electrons? Remember that all atoms want eight, except for the really small ones, they're good with two. So the exceptions here are hydrogen and boron. Hydrogen wants a maximum of two electrons, and boron wants a maximum of six electrons, not eight. In general, carbon, nitrogen, and sulfur can form double and triple bonds. So in terms of bonds, we have single, double, and triple bonds, and that's the highest it goes to a triple bond. And you will learn later on in this video how these atoms form double and triple bonds. So let's take a look at CF4 and draw the Lewis dot diagram of CF4. First, you're going to count the total number of valence electrons. So using your periodic table, how many valence electrons does carbon have? We have four from carbon, and how about fluorine? We have seven from fluorine, but there's four of them, right? So that's a total of 28. What's 28 plus four? That's 32 valence electrons. That means that we have 32 valence electrons to work with as we draw our molecule. So the first step is to put the single atom in the middle. So out of CF4, which one is the single atom? Carbon. So carbon goes in the middle. Now there are four fluorines. Now I like to keep my drawings neat and I like to think about symmetry. So I put them around carbon in the order of left, right, bottom, top. It really doesn't matter what order you go in, just that you have four fluorines around carbon. And then we're going to draw bonds. Where do you draw these bonds? In between the two elements so that they connect, so that they are bonded together. So in each bond, we have an electron coming from carbon and carbon has four valence electrons, so it makes sense that it has four valence electrons around it, and it's sharing with the one electron from fluorine. So one from that fluorine, another one from that fluorine, another one from that fluorine, and another one from that fluorine. Remember that each bond consists of two electrons that are being shared. So how many electrons did we just draw by drawing the four bonds? We drew eight valence electrons. So from our total number of valence electrons, we're going to subtract eight. What's 32 minus eight? That's 24. Now we have 24 valence electrons to work with. So with those remaining valence electrons, we want to take care of the outside atoms first. How many more do you draw? If fluorine already has two electrons, then we're going to draw six more so that it has a total of eight. Remember, all atoms want eight valence electrons, right? So let's draw six more valence electrons around each fluorine. Well, how many additional electrons did we just draw? Six on each, six times four is 24. We drew 24 valence electrons and we have none left. 
So let's double check our work. Does each element have eight valence electrons? Yes, it does. Carbon has a total of eight. Remember that when it shares electrons in a bond, fluorine's electron will count for carbon as well. And then each fluorine also has eight, seven from fluorine and one from carbon. So that's a total of eight. So we double checked our work and we're good. Every single element has eight valence electrons. So what is the correct Vesper shape of this molecule? We'll take a look at how many outside atoms it has. It has one, two, three, four. Do you remember the shape that indicates four outside atoms? That's right, tetrahedral. Now let's take a look at NH3. How many valence electrons from nitrogen? Five. How about from hydrogen? One each. So that's a total of eight valence electrons that we have to work with. So the single element goes in the middle, in this case that's nitrogen, and then you put your hydrogens all around it. So I do left, right, bottom. If you want to put your hydrogens on the top and the left and the bottom, that's fine. As long as you have three hydrogens, one nitrogen, and the correct number of valence electrons, that's all that matters. So now, what do we do next? We put the elements down. Now it's time to bond them, right? So let's create the bonds. Let's keep count. How many valence electrons did we just draw? Yes, we drew three bonds, but remember that's a total of six electrons. So eight minus six is two. We have now two to work with. So where do we put the two? One on each hydrogen? No, that wouldn't be right. Remember how many electrons does hydrogen want? Hydrogen is happy with two. Does hydrogen have those two valence electrons? Yes, it does. One, two. The two electrons that hydrogen wants are coming from that bond. One of the electrons are already hydrogens, and then nitrogen is sharing its electron. So each hydrogen already has two valence electrons. So if the outside atoms are good, where do you think those two leftover electrons are going to go? They're going to go on the central atom, and this is called a lone pair. So did we use up all the electrons? So two minus two is equal to zero. Yes, we did. So remember, we need to now double check. Does each hydrogen have two valence electrons? Yes, it does. Each of them are coming from the bond. What about nitrogen? Does nitrogen have eight valence electrons? Yes, it does. Two from this bond, four electrons, total of four, total of six, and a total of eight. Nitrogen has eight valence electrons. So again, this here is called a lone pair. It's on the central atom. Now, if you're wondering if these electrons are also lone pairs, the ones around the fluorine, they're not lone pairs. What makes it a lone pair? The fact that it's on the central atom, okay? Not the outside atom. So this atom has one lone pair of electrons. So what shape is it? Well, taking a look at the outside atoms, we have one, two, three outside atoms. So it's gotta be one of the tries, but which one? It's the pyramid. Why? Because it's the pyramid that has the lone pairs. Go ahead and try BF3 on your own. Keep in mind that boron also has an exception. It doesn't want eight valence electrons. Instead, it's happy with six. So go ahead and try this problem and play when you're ready to check your answer. So does your molecule match my molecule? You should have started with 24 valence electrons. After drawing the three bonds, you subtract six, so you have a total of 18 to work with. Remember, where do those 18 go? They need to first go on the outside atom. After you draw them on the outside atoms, you drew all of 18, so now you have none left. Are all of them satisfied with eight valence electrons and with the exception of boron wanting six? Yes. 
again, if your drawing looks a little bit different, where your flooring is on top instead of on the right side, that's okay. So what shape is this? It's a trigonal planar shape because it doesn't have any lone pairs. Go ahead and try HF. Play the video when you're ready to check your answer. Did you get this far? I'm not done with my drawing yet because I wanted to explain where these six valence electrons go. In this case, these are both considered the outside atoms. So then where would you place the six valence electrons? Would you split it up and put three and three on both? No. Remember that hydrogen only wants two max, and hydrogen has those two electrons coming from the bond. So with that said, where do the six valence electrons go? It's going to go around the fluorine. Now in this case, there's only two outside atoms, so you probably narrowed it down to it being linear or bent. And you're thinking, hey, aren't those lone pairs on the fluorine? Well, no, they're not. Because if these are both outside atoms, there's no central atom. So if there's no central atom, that means these are not lone pairs. Remember that lone pairs are only on the central atom. So this one is a linear shape. Go ahead and count up the total number of valence electrons for CO2. So for CO2, we have a total of 16 valence electrons to work with. I placed the C in the middle and two of the oxygens on the outside, and I used up four electrons, so that's a total of 12 valence electrons that are left. Where are those 12 going to go? Right, it's going to go on the outside atoms. So six on that O and six on this O. I used up all 12. Now I have to double check my work. Do all of the atoms have eight valence electrons? If you take a look at this oxygen, it does have a total of eight. If you take a look at this oxygen, it has a total of eight. What about this carbon? Carbon only has four valence electrons. It doesn't have enough. It wants a total of eight. But do we have any more valence electrons to draw? We don't have any, we ran out. So what do we do? Well, in this case, now the oxygen is going to share more of its electrons with carbon, and guess what? That's how we get a double bond. So these electrons are going to share and form that double bond. Once it does that, these electrons are going to be erased because these electrons are now in the bond. Let's count it again. Now that we moved a pair of electrons, do we have a total of eight? Does this oxygen still have eight? Yes, it does. Two, four, six, eight. This oxygen is good to go. This oxygen is still good to go. We did not do anything to that. But what about the carbon? Does it now have eight? Well, no, it has two, four, six. So what are we going to do now? If you thought that the other oxygen will now give up those two electrons, you're right. This oxygen on the right won't give up more electrons. It can, but remember I talked about symmetry? Let's just balance it out. So if we did it to this oxygen, then the other oxygen will share its electrons. And then we erase those two electrons. So now let's count it again. Does this oxygen have eight? Yes, it does. Does this carbon have eight electrons? Yes, it does. Two, four, six, eight. Does this atom have eight electrons? Yes, it does. So this carbon has two pairs of double bonds. Double bond on the left side, double bond on the right side. So what shape is this? Well, the bonds don't change the shape. We're still looking at the outside atoms, and we have two outside atoms with a central atom. So what shape is that? That's a linear shape.
Let's take a look at our last example. Go ahead and try to do this on your own. So we have a total of 10 valence electrons. We just drew a bond, so that we subtracted two valence electrons for a total of eight. Those eight are going to go on the outside of nitrogen. And it doesn't matter where you put those eight valence electrons, because remember, these are both on the outside. So I subtract eight, I don't have any more to work with, so now what? Because if you take a look, the nitrogen on the right side does not have eight valence electrons. So what did we say in the previous problem? We said that one of the atoms will share more of its electrons. Well, which one do you think will share its electrons? The one on the right or the one on the left? It's really going to be the one that has more electrons. So these are going to come in and share to form that double bond. So let's count again. Does it have eight valence electrons now? Well, the one on the left has eight valence electrons, but the one on the right? No, it has two, four, six valence electrons. So what now? Now, the one on the left will then share more of its electrons. And what do you think this is called now? Yeah, it's called the triple bond. Does each nitrogen have eight valence electrons? Yes, it does. Two, four, six, eight. Two, four, six, eight. And we're done. What's the shape of this? And there's only two elements here, right? Two atoms, so they are considered the outside atoms. Are these dots considered lone pairs? No, because there is no central atom. So remember, if there's no central atom, they're not lone pairs. So what shape is this? Linear. Now there were two more shapes that you guys explored in the FET simulation, trigonal bipyramidal and octahedral. We call those expanded octets. There are times when the main group elements in the third row and below form compounds that deviate from the octet rule by having more than eight valence electrons. The octet rule can be expanded by some elements by utilizing the d orbitals. Sulfur, phosphorus, silicon, and chlorine are common examples that form an expanded octet. So the two shapes that you explored that have an expanded octet is a trigonal bipyramidal and then an octahedral. Both of these do not have lone pairs. Trigonal bipyramidal has five outside atoms, and an octahedral has six outside atoms. I know when you think of octa, you think of eight. But if you think of this shape in a 3D form, then it actually has eight faces, so eight sides. So even though it has six outside atoms, the octa comes from the eight sides or the eight faces that form in this octahedral shape. So the trigonal bipyramidal has two bond angles. There's a 90 degree angle that goes from here to here. And then there's 120 if you can imagine, this one is coming out towards you. From here, from this one, the one that's sticking up to the one that's coming out, that would be 120 degrees. And the octahedral, all of these bond angles are 90 degrees. So I know by looking at the formula, you can probably predict what shape it's going to form, but let's go through the steps to draw our molecule SF6. So we have a total number of 48 valence electrons to work with in this molecule. Sulfur is going to go in the middle. We're going to put six fluorines on the outside. I just place them diagonally once I place them on the left, right, top and bottom. Let's go ahead and make our bonds. So we just used 12 electrons. So we have 36 left over. Those 36 are going to go on the fluorine. And we used up all 36, and we don't have any more to work with. And this is an octahedral shape. Now, what if we have a polyatomic ion? Remember that the charge tells you how many electrons you are gaining or losing. So for example, with sulfate, we're going to count up the total number of valence electrons coming from the sulfur and the oxygen. And then we're going to add two electrons because it has an overall charge of minus two. Remember, that means that you are gaining two electrons. So we have a total of 32 valence electrons. So let's put the sulfur in the middle and the four oxygens on the outside. 
We're going to go ahead and bond them. Subtract 8. We have 24 to work with. Those 24 are going to go on the outside of each oxygen. We used up all 24 and we don't have any more to work with. Now when you're dealing with polyatomic ions, there's one more thing that you have to remember. You have to draw brackets around the entire molecule and put the overall charge on the outside of those brackets. So that charge on the outside indicates that this sulfate molecule or sulfate ion gained two electrons. And then what is the Vesper shape of this, of this sulfate ion? It's a tetrahedral. So for carbonate, we have 24 valence electrons to work with. Put the carbon in the middle, put the oxygens on the outside, and bond each one. Subtract 6, and we have 18 to work with. And we're going to place those 18 on the outside of the oxygens. And we used up all 18, and we don't have any more to work with. Double check your work. Do all of your atoms have eight valence electrons? No, which one does not? Carbon does not. Carbon only has six around it. So now what? If you said that oxygen will share more of its electrons with carbon, yes, you're absolutely right. So where do we take it from? Do you think it matters? It really doesn't matter. We can take it from here and that will come in and a double bond will form. Maybe you want to take it from the right side, that's fine. Maybe you want to take it from the bottom oxygen and that's fine. So technically, the electrons are being shared equally everywhere. So to represent that in a drawing, we have to show that in all the different possible ways that double bond can exist. So I'm going to draw the double bond on the right side this time. I'll draw another one where the double bond is pointing to the bottom oxygen. And to represent that that bond can really be anywhere, we use a double arrow and draw all the possible ways that the double bond can be formed. This is called resonance. Resonance structures is a way of describing delocalized electrons within certain molecules where the bonding cannot be described by a single Lewis dot structure. So what kind of shape is this carbonate? Trigonal planar. So next, let's talk about the types of bonds. The Vesper theory works well when accounting for molecular shapes, but it does not help much in describing the types of bonds that are formed. In hybridization, several atomic orbitals mix to form new identical orbitals. So what exactly is mixing together? Remember when we talked about S orbital and P orbital and D orbital? Well, those are the orbitals that are mixing together and we have new orbitals, new atomic orbitals. So one s orbital and one p orbital can hybridize and make an sp hybrid orbital. It's a lot easier than you think. You just have to be able to count the number of electron pairs that are surrounding a central atom. So when we talk about bond hybridization or try to identify the type of hybridization, we refer to the electron pairs both that are bonded and non-bonded, so non-bonded meaning the lone pairs on the central atom, we refer to the electron pairs as electron domains or electron groups. So for example, in this picture, when we're talking about A as a central atom, we have one electron domain right here from this bond. We have it from the other side from this bond, so that's two. We have the lone pair, that's a third electron domain, or an electron group. And then the double bond actually just counts as one electron domain, one electron group. 
So in a double or triple bond, all electrons shared between those two atoms are on the same side of the central atom. Therefore, they count as one electron domain or group. So this molecule has a total of four electron domains. So if the central atom of a molecule has two electron domains, we say that the hybridization is sp. If it has three electron domains, then the hybridization is sp2. If it has four electron domains, then the hybridization is sp3. It can go into d, so sp3d, but you don't need to know that in honors chem. So let's take a look at the example on the left. We just said in the previous slide that this one has four electron domains. So what kind of hybridization is this? sp3. How about this one, CO2? How many electron domains does it have? One, two. So this hybridization is sp. Go ahead and pause the video here and determine the hybridization around the central atom for each of these molecules. All of these molecules were mentioned in today's notes. You may want to refer to your Lewis dot structures to get a good visual of what this molecule looks like. That way you can clearly see how many electron domains are around the central atom of each of these molecules. Once you're done, play the video and you can see the answers.